is the last lecture. We'll see how far we get. Uh, I'll try not to speed up too much. So uh, what is the plan? We'll try to do what I hope to do. I'll do today, it's very important, resonances, uh, examples of resonances uh, in one channel scattering of two spinless particles. Then uh, we'll try to construct interpolators for such a case. Then we'll do as much as we can of the remaining two topics, which would be a couple channel scattering and scattering of two hadrons with spin. Okay, so first the resonances, this is the standard thing in this, um, in this business. Okay, so binder, how do we extract the resonance mass and the width? So we need to determine discrete eigen energies on the lattice. We put two hadrons in a box, determine discrete eigen energies, and from each energy we can determine the phase shift at that energy, and hopefully then the phase shift for various energies will have the shape and will be able to determine the mass and the width. This is a reminder. Okay, what do we expect to get as a scattering amplitude? We expect to get bright Wigner scattering amplitude of this form. Um, not exactly this, but this is expected for a kind of resonance scattering. And if you express the width in terms of the phase space and the coupling, and you rewrite this equation, then you get that basically what you expect that this quantity, p to the power of l plus l times cotangent delta over e, should be linearly falling with energy squared. And if you get this, you're happy, you can extend the matter, as I will show you. Okay, this is just a reminder of what we have done analytically. Then uh, another reminder, then such scattering amplitude doesn't have pole on for the real energies, you can see because there's this I here, but it has a pole for complex energy. It will have a pole for a complex energy on Riemann sheet two away from the real axis. And then this gives you the resonance mass and then this the distance gives you the width. Okay, so, well, pi pi scattering has been done by many lattice groups. It's not because it's in, in the raw meson channel where the raw resonance appears. It's not because it's the most interesting resonance, it's just because it's the easiest. So it's very difficult to choose which simulation to present. So I decided to present our own, which was done a long time ago, 2011. And it's a little bit primitive by current standards. Now these uh, simulations are done much better, but maybe this is good for school. So what do you do? You, uh, we only had one volume. You need to determine uh, the two pi and discrete energies in finite volume. So you will take this kind of interpolators. For example, for total momentum zero, you have various interpolators of q bar q and of two pions. And that if, if the total momentum is zero, pion can have momentum one minus one. Okay. You use these interpolators and then compute the correlation function. This would be the weak contractions you need to evaluate, and we did evaluate them with the distillation method, like most of current studies. And then you extract the eigenenergies, and you get that here you get these two eigenenergies. This dashed line is very important. Dashed line means what would be the energy of two pions if they didn't. So it would be just the sum of this energy of this pion and this energy of this pion. But since they are interacting, these energies a little bit shift. And the important point is you need to resolve these energy shifts with respect to these dash lines in order to be able to extract something. Okay, this is for total momentum zero. You repeat the exercise for total momentum one. So the pi pi operator would be here, one would have momentum zero, and here one would have momentum one. You make the simulation, you get two energy levels. 
and for to the momentum 110 you repeat and you get this okay so you get six energy levels that's not many by this standard but from each of those you can extract the phase shift via the Lusher equation so so basically there is six energy levels and from each energy you can extract the phase shift at that energy from this Lusher relation that we talked about a lot in this course and we derived it so you get for example from the for this energy you get this phase shift and this energy this phase shift these red dots give you the energy dependence of phase shifts okay and i was quite happy when i saw this curve in 2011 it, it did have a resonant uh, curve structure so basically there is not many points but you can already see that the phase shift passes 90 degrees at about 0 0.77 gv and that would be resonance mass and you know that that's closely where actually the raw resonance mass actually lies okay so and um one wants to also extract the width so what does one typically do in this business well one parameterizes the width in terms of the coupling and um, the phase space and partial wave L is equal to one in this case, okay? So again, you expect that this quantity P cube times cotangent delta over E will have this form if this is a kind of a bright wing resonance. So you plot this quantity, okay? I put energy square here and you see that this P cube cotangent delta really is linearly falling. So you say, okay, this basically has a bright Wigner shape resonance. And well, what's the mass? The mass is where this is zero. So at the point where this is zero, this happens at 0 0.77 GV. You really uh, get the resonance mass. And that's, as I said, close to what is in experiment. And the slope gives you the coupling G. From the slope, you can read of the coupling G. And it's typically quoted by groups. It's not the coupling G, but something multiplied by square root of six pi, never mind. So, so what we extract is the coupling 5.6, and it's close to 16 experiments. So it's rather close. Any questions here? No? Okay. Another um, more advanced example of a pi pi study in the raw channel, a later one, from the Hudspec collaboration. They use several volumes and more total momenta, and you see they extract a resonance phase shift in more detail. So let's see. Phase shift 90 degrees is basically reached at 0 0.13. So this will be their mass of a row here. Okay, from this resonant phase shift, you can extract the scattering amplitude. And by continuing the scattering amplitude to the complex energy plane, you can also extract at which energy, complex energy, the scattering amplitude has a pole. And it has a pole at this complex energy. So basically, and if you remember some lectures ago, the pole will be at a position where um, the, the real component with the mass, you see, 0 0.13 again in these units. This is the mass. And this distance will be gamma. OK. Um, basically, what is given here, it's result from several parameterization, which are bright wigner like and you can get, see that several parameterization gives similar energy. Why parameterization? You have to kind of parameterize this phase shift as a function of energy to really get some result. 
Okay, and the raw resonance is the only resonance that has been extracted by many lattice groups. It's the easiest. It's the first one that every group that enters this business would do. Okay, maybe before telling you the result, no, let me tell you the results. So what people extract? People extract the resonance mass. This is the experimental value, 770. And you can see that the mass rises as the pile mass would rise. Kind of not all the groups get the agreement, but okay. Um, and this is a re result from various groups from, from a review from three years ago. By now there is even many more results, okay. Okay, so the mass of the raw resonance rises with the pile mass that you are not surprised. What about the width? It, the width depends on the phase space and the phase space strongly depends on the mass of a pion. If you don't have a physical pion mass, it makes no sense to compare width to experiment. So what one does is to parameterize the width in terms of a coupling and the phase space, and then the coupling is extracted and compared to experiment. And the coupling is six in experiment, and you can see it's close to six by any lattice simulation. So I think this problem is solved on the lattice. This is a simple problem, the simplest one. And the simplification here comes basically because the two pions have the same mass, and then that in a given irreducible representation, partial odd and even waves do not mix. Uh, this happens when two degenerate particles scatter, as I explained last lecture. When you have non-degenerate masses like in K-pi scattering, then uh, this is no longer the case. The life is much more complicated. Uh, several groups also studied K-pi scattering, not so many. Okay, so again, the first, so is there some questions so far before I proceed? Um, yes, maybe uh, we could go to, to the slide before this one. Which one? Is this? 14? No, no, yeah? no. Uh, no, no, the, the slide before the last one. Can you tell me the slide number, yeah, please? Yeah, this one. Uh, so, uh, okay. if I understand correctly, then it's not uh, reasonable to compare different, uh, to compare um, row masses uh, for different pile masses, but it's reasonable to compare uh, all these results for, for the coupling. <laughs> what to say? I mean, obviously the uh, coupling doesn't depend much on a pile mass, okay, that you can see here. Uh, you see that the, the masses for a given pile mass do differ. Okay, you know, this is, a, uh, let me give you a disclaimer. Of course, these are results only at the one lattice spacing. None of those simulations, I guess, did the extrapolation to lattice spacing zero. These are not precision calculations. So there may be additional systematics that is not taken into account in these numbers. Um, there, there may be more. Um, so ideally, this would agree. But the agreement is not so, I mean, OK, it's 100 MeV. It's not so huge, I would still say, no. Okay, this one is off. I don't know what is this one. I don't want to <laughs> comment. Um, these are, yeah. More questions? Um, yes, so um, if you go back a couple slides, um, I think 14. Mm -hmm. Yes, so also the uh, bottom right plot, this is all for one lattice spacing, right? Sure. I mean, I think all calculations said, except for maybe a few recent ones are just one lattice spacing. 
none of these calculations is done in a precision sense that is done on several lattice principles. Maybe there is some by now for rho, but not for any other meson, to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Some more question? This is not only one lattice spacing, this is also one lattice volume. Currently people do it on several volumes. And one disclaimer is that exponentially suppressed terms in volumes are neglected in Lusher's formalism. And if your volume is not enough, that may not be the case. That is also maybe the reason why all these numbers in mass don't agree. More questions? Uh, uh, yeah, just a confirmation basically, but uh, basically, yeah, in the slide before this one, so the same, uh, 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 I, I did, uh, so my question is like, um, I, I'm not sure that I quite understood how I extract the the width from the lattice. So I, uh, from the slope of the previous plot that you show, I can get the, the coupling square, if I understood correctly. Yeah, maybe it's and easier here. Uh, From yeah. this slope, you get the coupling squared. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then and I use the, the coupling width square. Is then okay, okay. The okay. coupling square times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The moment of a moment p is the moment of a meson uh, for the energy at the room of meson mass, kind of somehow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So basically from this slope. So, so the, directly from the slope. Or the width the... kind of, you can also, you can extra, uh, you can, um, this kind of gives you the width as well, kind of, you know, how, how, how quickly it goes. But oh, exactly, yeah. it gives you the slope and then slope is parameterized by. Uh, yeah, 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 the bright figure. Oh, G, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, so yeah. And the okay. other way is that um, if you look at the, uh, the um, at the position of the poles. Um, okay, if you know that the pole of a scattering matrix is here, you look at the real part, the real part will give you the mass of a resonance. Yes. While the imaginary part will give you the half of the width, but here twice the imaginary part is drawn. So the imaginary part gives you the width directly. Okay. 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 Thank so you. This is two ways, and for a narrow resonance, you expect to get the same result. Basically, from both procedures. More. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, k pi scattering. This is already um, um, quite uh, more challenging. Actually, we did a calculation, the first calculation of K-star meson with back in 2012, but I'm not presenting this calculation. Um, I'm presenting a more follow-up calculation. Okay, again, you put the K on and up in a box. You determine the eigenenergies for various total momenta, okay and various EREPs. EREPs, irreducible representations, have some weird names, don't worry about them, okay? For various EREPs. And you get these eigenenergies, and it's important you observe the energy shifts from non-interacting levels, which is the, indicated by the dashed lines. Now, um, okay, now what would happen if only one partial wave contributes to a given EREP. Then the story is simple. Then you have this determinant equation, which if only partial wave L contributes, is basically this equation. And you get the scattering amplitude. Uh, let me remind you, G is a known function, and the function of energy. So if you measure lattice energy E, through this equation, you'll get the scattering amplitude that this lattice energy E immediately. Okay. This is the Lucia equation we used so far, basically. Here, the life is more complicated. In k pi scattering, since k on and pi on don't have the same mass, then it happens that for total momentum bigger than zero, you get for um, 
uh, get contributions from even and odd partial waves into single irreducible representation. So let us discuss how to even tackle this. This is a difficult problem. Uh, for example, partial wave L equal to zero and L equal to one contributor. None of them is negligible. Okay, so what's the problem? So this is the quantization Lucius condition. Okay, what is the scattering matrix? The matrix has partial wave zero and has partial wave one. The problem is that these two loop function, kinematical function, which is known, is non-diagonal. And that's, that's, that, that's why when you write the determinant, both of these will contribute. So what to do? This determinant condition will be then such, some function of the both scattering amplitudes of partial wave zero and one will be equal to zero. Okay, you know this condition. The problem is, okay, you measure one energy level. And so you'll know some relation between those two quantities. But from one relation, you cannot extract two quantities, never, right? So you have one relation between two quantities for a given energy, but you cannot not extract both. Okay, now the rescue, the general idea was suggested by these authors long, quite a time ago, and it was criticized at the beginning by the people who they apply on this, this procedure, but it's the most widely applied general idea. Okay, so what is the rescue? It's not so simple, so let me try to explain. Okay, the idea is that this scattering amplitude for a given partial wave is always like this, is parameterized in terms of constants, several parameters. Okay, so for example, what could you do? We discussed about how the scattering, uh, this quantity should behave near threshold. It should be Taylor series in P squared. So, so this is one idea how to parameterize. You say that this thing you parameterize for partial wave L as a, uh, in terms of three constants, which is already optimistic if you're finally able to determine three constants. Suppose you do it and then you throw this in here. So your scattering amplitude for partial wave L parameterized in terms of three constants. So how to determine those constants now? You have to determine them from the lattice data. Now, how should you determine those? The ideal constants would be such that this determinant would be zero um, at the energies which you measure as eigenenergies. So basically, let me remind you for this particular calculation that this determinant should be equal to zero uh, for those energies which are given here. This determinant uh, condition is given for each rep and for each total momentum. So for example, if you have total momentum zero and this rep, you want that this determinant is equal to zero at these energies. Those would be the ideal parameters that solve your problem. Or for this total momentum and this rep, you want that this determinant is equal to zero at these energies which are measured here. Okay. So this would be ideal. But this is almost impossible to achieve, that this would be exactly zero on all measured lattice energies. So what one does, basically, what one says, okay, this condition for a given number uh, values of parameters will predict me the energies. The, the values of the model energies for given parameters. And you want that these values of energies predicted will be as close to the measured ones on the lattice. So basically, you determine the parameters that 
the, there is energies which depend on the parameters of your parameterization and the measured one will be as close as possible. In practice, you basically uh, minimize the chi-square and determine the best parameters. Okay, so you par the, the, to, to wrap up again, you parameterize both amplitudes and then determine the values of parameters which basically better, best fit your lattice energies. And that is not only done for such case, this is done also for couple channel scattering and for many other applications. That's why I went a little bit in more detail for this one. Okay, this is not so simple. So if there is questions, maybe you can ask now. Or, okay, let me give you uh, uh, this example till the end. Okay, so, so these orders here determined the parameters of partial wave, uh, of k-pi scattering in partial wave zero and one. And you can use several parameterizations. And here are the results. Um, okay, let's consider the blue results, which are closest to, closer to the physical point. Okay, so what they extract is the phase shift in partial wave equal to one. You see this blue result? It's typical resonance phase shift. Um, so you can already read of the resonance. The resonance of that will appear in this k pi scattering with partial wave one will be the vector resonance k star. And you can already see that this will be nearly 900 MeV from here. And that's also in experiment. Okay. Okay. And um, well, uh, when par uh, par 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 parameterization of the S wave scattering phase, phase shift, they get this result, this blue result. The phase shift rises but never reaches 90 degrees. Okay. So, you know, phase shift is directly uh, giving you the scattering amplitude. So when you have the phase shift, you are happy. Okay, now, now another question. Here, it's obvious we have a resonance. It's crossing 90 degrees, it's around 900 MeV. What about here? Do we have a resonance or we don't? It never reaches 90 degrees. <laughs> oh, well, here the resonance that would appear would be K star. Here the resonance that would appear would be a so-called kappa resonance. It is a scalar resonance that is now back to PDG. So how do you do, how do you decide whether there is a resonance here or not? The modern way of deciding it is to see whether there is a pole of a scattering amplitude in the complex plane. Okay, so you, you, you look whether there is a uh, uh, pole in the sc uh, scattering in the complex plane and here you find it here. For any parameterization they find nearly the same pole here. So let's see, it's basically near 900 MeV, which is correct. And the width is the width is basically it's around 30 MeV, not so far from experimental width. And the coupling is nearly experimental. Well, what about for this guy? Well, although this phase shift never passes 90 degrees, they find the pole. But the position of this pole strongly depends on how they parameterize this scattering amplitude. This is just one parameterization, there is other parameterizations. So um, here they conclude that, okay, there is a resonance, but the determination of pole location is kind of ambiguous. And this is the location of the pole, this kappa resonance from PDG. You see, it's quite uncertain also. Because even from experiment, one has to 
experiment is done also for only for real energies and then from experimental data to determine whether this is a pole in the scattering amplitude it's not so simple okay now before i move on i'm wondering if there is some question these were very important i think applications for further understanding these parameterizations No? Okay, if you think of a question, please let me know. Okay, so last time we discussed bound states, virtual bound states. Today we discussed resonances. Now, um, now a bit of a technical aside before we go back to physics. How do we construct operators for, for two hadrons? Um, there is a number of typos. Sorry. Um, I'll just show it for scattering of two hadrons with zero spin. Okay. And um, well, two hadrons with zero spin, many hadrons are very important, have zero spin, like pions, kms, d mesons, p mesons, beta. So any of the scattering for those, uh, um, you can construct in the following way that I'll tell you. The most typical way people do is to use the projection method, which is a group mathematical method um, widely used. So what one does, um, the claim is that the operator, if you want the operator with total momentum P, uh, transforms according to a given irreducible representation and throw R of a reducible representation. So let me give you some idea of these rows. Suppose you have a irreducible representation T1 of group OH. T1 is nothing but kind of things that are related to spin one. So what would be the rows? You can either have rows which are uh, denote X, Y, Z for this, or mj equal to minus one zero one. So this would be the three rows in this EREPS. And this is three-dimensional EREP, just to give you some. These things, these rows transform uh, into each other with the rotations. Yes. Okay, so how do you construct operator with uh, which transform according to given EREP and row R? You do this, you do, uh, you sum over all elements of the group R, here you put the representation matrix of this element R um, uh, for this EREP. I'll tell you how this is obtained or where is it read from. RR means what? This is a matrix. So RR is a diagonal element of this matrix. Now what is this? This is the application of the, this element R on some two hadron operator. So now our two hadrons don't carry any spin. So this rotation will only act on the momenta. So if these hadrons don't carry spin, the rotations act on the momenta. So this is what you get. This is very simple. Okay. Now um, there is a proof why this operator that is obtained in this way transforms according to given EREP. And you see it has three lines and basically uh, is based on the wigner eckhart theorem. So I will not, you can look at the proof yourself. But this is a well-known projection method. Okay, but now let's try to apply it. What you need, the only thing you need is this representations, right? So you need these representations. Now, these are discrete groups, like in chemistry for crystals. So you'll get most literature on that by looking into chemical tables. Okay, I will take a look here. But usually these chemical tables will not give you the matrices themselves, but the characters, which means basically the sum of diagonal elements. So let me just give you one example. 
So uh, let me see this. Um, okay. Okay, suppose um, you want group OH. Where is OH? I don't find it. Why not? OH. Okay, you see, these are the elements. There is 48 elements. Uh, this is the usual cubic box. And then there is irreducible representations. Okay. And what is given here, this is the characters for each element and each irrep. Okay. Uh, we will make an example with this group as an exercise C2V because it only has four elements. The symmetry will be much reduced. You see here there is only four irreps and four elements, and these are the characters. Okay, so the major point is that characters are easily obtained for any group you will be probably interested in. So what does it help you? Um, no, sorry, no, where do we want to go here? What does it help you? Okay, there is several irreps that only have one dim uh, um, one dimension. If an irrep has one dimension, then the, the character is equal to the diagonal element already because this is one by one matrix. So for one dimensional irreps, this is already given by the character so you can get the operator in a given irrep just by summing over all characters and then you need to do this application. So I propose as an exercise um, to do one example to, because this is actually simple, we can do it. Okay, so basically what I'll do, I'll go actually to my iPad to do it from scratch. Let's see how this goes, um, iPad. Um, uh -huh. I have to turn it on. Okay, so let's consider the example of um, group, this group, which I've shown you in the table. Uh, sometimes lately it's called like this. Okay, so it has only four elements. It's related to the systems which have total momentum one, one, zero, okay? And you can see that if you want to leave this momentum invariant, there is only four elements that do it. If you want to leave four, this momentum invariant, basically there is uh, four elements which I'll describe in detail what they do, okay? So, um, so how do you get an operator, for example, that transforms according to this irrep. So let's do it. Operator with momentum one, one, zero, which transforms according to B3 is, what I need to do is sum over all four elements, uh, put the character of this B3, which are uh, given uh, here, And, um, um, and then let me take, here I have to do, here I have to take a combination of two momenta, P1 and P2, which are given here, which give us a sum one, one, zero. So I'll take this combination, for example. So, so I put element on one, zero, one, the first hadron and are zero, one, minus one. Let's see what do we get. Given these two momenta, either we can get something or we can get even zero, if this doesn't even couple to this uh, irrep. Okay, so, so let's see. The first element is identity, this is given here. 
So, and the character is one, so uh, this is easy. So we'll just write, um, so we just write H1 and the identity, uh, I'll be, this will be important. Uh, maybe I use another color here. I'll be always acting on these two momenta. So the, when the identity acts, I, of course, I get the same. This is trivial. So this is the first term. Then will be the second term for, uh, for this one. And then the character is minus one. So I put minus here. Now, what does this element do? C2. Um, this element rotates by pi around this axis. So uh, this is my axis y, this is my axis x, and it rotates by pi around this axis. So what will it do? It will invert z direction, uh, z component, and, uh, um, and exchange x and y. So let's see. So h1, if I work on this one, it exchanges, as I said, x and y, so I get this, and invert z. So that's what I get. And h2, it exchanges x and y, it, I'll get this, and inverts z. Okay, is there some questions so far? No? Okay. So, so now going to the third element. The character of the third element is one. So plus one, what does this uh, element do? That's this guy. This guy, what this means, sigma? It means, um, no, in general, sigma v, v means a reflection over plane perpendicular to V. Okay, so let's see. We need a plane that is perpendicular to this vector given here. Okay, so, sorry. So, uh, this, this is Y, this is X, this is this vector, um, going like this, so I think this is the plane. This is the plane, let me verify. Yeah, this is the plane, and I need to do the reflection over this plane, reflection. So what it will do, it will invert X and Y, while it will not change Z. So let's see, so let's do it. I'm applying this to this again h1, it will invert x and y, so, but it will leave z invariant. So it will invert this and leave z invariant, okay? And there is only one element left. Um, yeah. Um, this is, Maybe I, sorry, just to get some space, I need to be inventive. I'll just delete this. Okay, so the, ne the, the last element is this guy. I need to uh, make a reflection. So again, let's see. This is X and Y. And I need to do um, a reflection in, um, in X, Y plane. And that will leave X and Y invariant, but just will invert Z. And the character is minus one, so let's, let me act on this. I, it leaves X and Y invariant, it will invert Z. Okay, I hope I didn't do the mistake, but I'm claiming now that this sum behaves, transforms according to a reducible representation B3. Um, and it can be used for, 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 for scattering studies, which I have shown many already. So these kind of operators were used. Um, well, um, is there 
some question here? Um, yes, Sasa, Lorenzo, mm -hmm. I have a question and sure. a comment related to this. The sum, should, the sum over the rotations should be over the group elements of the cubic group in this case, not of the rotation of the belonging to the reducible representation, just to be precise. Uh -huh. uh, actually, it, uh, not, uh, it has to be uh, um, over all groups that are relevant. I mean, you have a problem. If you have two scattering particles with total momentum 110, um, the relevant symmetry of a problem will not be the whole rotation group. It will be much reduced. It will be this moment, uh, this, this group. Yes, yes, sorry. So the comment was that uh, in the sum, R belonging to C to V, not to gamma, right? Aha, uh -huh. yeah, gamma, but uh, uh, R belonging to uh, gamma, sorry. But gamma is here, C, uh, okay, R belonging to gamma. Gamma is here, C to V. As, um, sorry. But with gamma, you mean the... Yeah, yeah, that, this is wrong. I, I'm... Um, yes, should be... Sorry, R, um, R, uh, R element of C to V. Aha, uh -huh. so this is wrong, kind of, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, my yeah, question yeah. was uh, different. If you have the hypercubic lattice, you have 24 elements. Mm -hmm. and you usually do the calculations by hand or you use a software for that? Um, um, that's, I mean, this is the list of a problem to get the operators usually, um, but I would use uh, Mathematica. I see. And I will actually tell you how to do it for uh, OH actually. I'll okay. tell you next, next slide. Thank you very much for covering this topic. Yeah, some more questions on this? Um, okay, so, um, so if not, I, I switch to exactly what uh, Lorenzo is asking. Um, and that's this. Okay, what about if you have, um, if you have, um, so this was this formula was relevant if you have one dimensional irrep because there is only one row. What about if you have multidimensional irreps and in this uh, this group most of the irreps have more than one dimensions. Okay, how do you do it? Then you need to know these elements. And let me tell you that this 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 these matrices, for example, are known for group OH in this appendix. They're all listed. But, uh, more typos, sorry, in the names. These are all listed. There's no problem. And I do it always with Mathematica. I implement the, 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 the scatterings from, from this reference, and I do it with Mathematica just to be on the safe side. I mean, then the more of a problem is that you have to compute all weak contractions. Then you have operators with, I don't know, 12 terms and then, <laughs> yeah. Okay, but all the, another problem is that all these matrices are not easily available for all groups in the literature. That is not, I didn't have, a, it was not easy always to find. Sometimes maybe they exist, but I don't know where to look for. The fact is that characters always exist. Okay, one thing you might do, compute those by yourself for some groups or ask your friend if he has them or she has them. Okay, but another thing is that the characters are, group, or used, um, um, are available for all groups. So, so what one could do, if you don't care to which row you project, then, then actually, Let's see what is a sum over all rows. Sum over all rows is by definition equal to this. And sum over all this is equal, equal, uh, equal to the character. So if you don't care to which row you are projecting, you know that this sum given by the characters will, um, will de definitely transform according to irad gamma but not to, according to a specific row. Okay, 
So I don't know, uh, Lorenzo, if I uh, answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe, can yeah. I ask only one sure. thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, you said here that if you don't care about which row you are projecting onto, which means basically if you don't care uh, in the continuum which MS you are projecting. Yeah, yeah. Right? this is a kind of, but you know, I don't know. Uh, okay, more to the question? No, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. This would be as if you didn't care which MS. But if you do a simulation, you will have uh, all operators according to a certain row. So you need usually to care because when you construct operators, you'll say, okay, I want row M S equal to one, all operators. Otherwise you will not get any coupling anyway. So usually you need to care about which row you want to project to. Thanks. Um, more? No. Okay, now we finished one part. I propose to make a five break and then uh, continue with couple channel scattering and ch scattering of um, squadrons with spin just to uh, refresh a little bit, okay? Um, yeah, okay, uh, let's I con um, propose reconvening in like four or five minutes. There's some more questions, meanwhile. Some more questions, meanwhile. Yes, I would have one. Okay, what's up? Hi. Yeah, um, with these operators, we if we calculate row by row operators, is that in, and then we calculate it for every row and take average, is that the same if we call or do the uh, example when we calculate the operator through the character. That means is yeah. the average over rows same as the below equation on the slide one to six. So you're uh, referring to this, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, this means... Because we have on the upper equation, we get the MS information, which is useful, but... 
What do you mean MS? Which MS? Uh, I mean the third component of the spin in Z direction. Because the sure, I mean, uh, uh, um, of course, this is like summing over all MS. So this is not. Um, I'm not claiming this is a good operator to use, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Because it's good to have an operator which transforms according to given a row. Uh, I'm just claiming that such a sum does transform according to given irrep, but doesn't transform according to certain MS. I, I'm not sure whether <laughs> I would suggest to use it. I'm just saying that yeah, but okay. an operator that transforms according to given irrep, here it is. But uh, I'm not it's so sure it's so useful. A lot of other information. You can get. Okay. Yeah, there is of course uh, many of those matrices are available in literature. So, yeah. or you can compute them by yourself. So, okay. thank you. Okay, maybe um, maybe we are back. We can continue. Okay, now um, to the two remaining topics. Uh, most of hadrons actually decay to more than. No. So far, we consider a homism that decays to pi pi, or k star which decays to k pi. But most of hadrons are strongly decaying, and most of those decay to more than one channel. Unfortunately, that's the major problem. While Lattice has not given all the answers to the Hadron spectroscopy questions. Uh, that's the reason why ex we don't still understand the exotic Hadrons. Okay, so, so, so for example, this Hadron is decaying to pi pi k, k, k. This one is decaying to pi, k, pi eta k, k. This one decays like this. The strange resonances decay to multiple, decay strongly to, to, to multiple uh, final states, the dimeson resonances and so on and so forth. And those are, at least those are conventional hadrons. And this one as well. And on top of that, almost all exotic hadrons decay strongly to several final states. All uh, discovered exotic hadrons, for example, the Z sub C, which is the first charged tetra quark that was discovered, decays to J psi pi, D D star, and eta zero. This guy, uh, Z sub B, decays to even more, to seven channels. I'm here naming just three. The penta quark was observed in the decay of J psi proton, but can also decay into other channels. And furthermore, this newly discovered charming tetra quark, it was discovered in J psi, J psi decay, but there is many more, there is several more channels. So, and here there is not so many answers. There is idea how to do it. So I'll try to present it on the simplest example. And that was the first result of a couple channel study using this Lucia approach by the Hadron Spectrum Collaboration. And I'm giving you an example of coupled scattering of K on pi and K on eta. So here, resonances that can decay in both of those appear. K on pi on, uh, we just studied. So the strategy is similar. And it's basically the same channel, K star would appear and kappa would appear. But this group also considered that it is actually coupled to another channel. It's coupled, it means that in nature, these can, can uh, if you have a k on pi on in nature, this can turn out as k eta sometime later. That means that things are coupled. Okay, so you take the operators, you'll take q q bar operators, you'll have operators of this type, k pi and operators of k eta. And eta is not easy, to be honest, because eta is itself, yeah, it's uh, not easy. Okay, so you would calculate the V contractions. The light would be red, the strange would be blue. You calculate the V contractions, you get the correlators, you extract the eigen energies for several volumes in several total momentum. 
So for example, this is the results. You have three volumes and the red line gives you what would be the energy of pi and kion if they are not interacting. And you can see that actually energies are slightly shifted away from the non-interacting. The green lines give you the energy of an eta kion if they don't interact. This is slight shifts. You really need to determine this very accurately. Otherwise, you're not ex able to extract scattering amplitude. And you do that for several EREPs. And what I'll have in mind further on, I'll have in mind this EREP where var various partial waves don't mix. Okay. Now, what is um, the challenge here? If you have a one channel scattering, we said that due to the unitarity, scattering amplitude, S, is parameterized as a function of single phase shift, where phase shift is dependent on energy. And for this parameterization, this is for one channel, this is one by one matrix. This is the most general thing that will satisfy this unitarity condition. What about for two channels? S has to be unitary again, it's two channels but it, uh, it's two by two matrix. And the general parameterization of two by two matrix, you can do it in various ways, but this is one way. You have one phase shift for channel one, which would be K pi. You have the second phase shift for channel K eta. And the third parameter is this eta, it's called inelasticity. And see if eta is one, Let's see what if eta is one. If eta is one, then this is zero, and this is zero, so this will be like diagonal scattering. There will be no mixing between k pi and k eta, but in general, because they, this k eta and k pi have the same quantum numbers, they in physics can kind of go to each other. So in general, there, this is non-zero. Okay, so this, and then, so you have a scattering matrix which is parameterized in terms of three parameters, which are also functions of energy. And since if you have a scattering matrix, also this matrix M, scattering matrix that we talked about, is two by two matrix. And you need to extract the information on all this matrix. And that's a challenge. Okay, so how does one do go about this? So let's let's see. So you have eigen energies from lattice. We've seen them two slides ago. And now this is still the quantization condition. It always kind of looks the same. Or the Lucia condition. Now what is this M? As we said, this M is two by two matrix now in these two channels. I'm giving you here the S matrix, but since S is two by two, M is also two by two. So M will have matrix elements M11, M22, and M12. Okay. This G, what is G? We learned that G is non-kinematical function, which just has uh, is finite volume correction to the two, two loop function, two, two propagator function, the two loop. A two, two propagator function related to this. And of course, these two, these two propagators don't mix. So basically you have this G for one channel, K pi, and the other one for K eta, but, but they don't mix. So in G, there is no off-diagonal element in channel space. So this determinant condition now is what? Um, well, for one energy, suppose you measure one energy on the lattice, like energy E from, for the lattice. Now this determinant condition gives you that at this energy, a certain function of this, this, and this is zero. Now we have one equation and three unknowns. There is no way you can determine all of them. No. Nobody was so smart, and there was no, there is no resolution to this, right? There is one and uh, one equation at a given energy, and three unknowns. Uh, 
which depend on energy. So you cannot determine from this one equation all these three matrix elements at that energy. Okay, so again, the same rescue as, as I described before. General idea is the same. The general idea is you parameterize these matrix elements of a scattering matrix as a function of some parameter C. So every one of those three is parameterized in terms of energy and some unknown parameters. If you wish, this is similar as if you would, I'm going one slide back, maybe you could parameterize also eta uh, and these two phase shifts as a function of few parameters, the same thing. You need to use some smart parameterization. And then what? Then basically determine the values of parameters similar as to what I described before. Um, you have your parameterization and that this determinant for the ideal values of parameters is equal to zero for all energies that you measure on the lattice. So let, let us get reminded what were the eigenenergies. These were the eigenenergies. You want that this determinant vanishes on all these eigenenergies. Okay. Maybe I should point out that for, for now, what I'm kind of having in mind is working in for, for this EREP, which only considers S wave scattering. There is no mixing between S wave and P wave. So. This EREP, which contains only S wave scattering, but although it only contains one scattering, one partial wave, S wave, it still has three, it has three parameters. These three parameters which depend on energy. So these are all phase shifts for S wave. These are all quantities that are related to S wave scattering. Still, there is three because we have two channels. Okay. And now what? So I said, you parameterize this matrix element as a function of parameters and try to determine best values parameters so that, um, like I basically explained before, you minimize this chi-square so that these energies which come as a model predictions are best, are closest to, to the energies measured on the lattice. Okay, then you determine these parameters. Of course, your parameterization has to make sense. And I've been working on this on another problem for half past year. Oof, it's, it's really challenging, but I think I succeed. Um, okay. Okay, so let's see the result for this uh, study of the Hadron spectrum collaboration. So I'm considering S wave scattering L equal to zero. This is, it is parameterized in terms of the phase shift for K pi, and that's the result they get. You see, it's kind of a resonant phase shift. It even has two bumps. Okay, let's try to understand why two bumps. S wave scattering. Probably there is this kappa here. Again, like in the previous study, and there will be another scalar resonance here. So we expect basically two resonances. And then it's parameterized in terms of phase shift for one channel. For the other channel, the phase shift for the other channel is this one is basically zero, not much interaction in this other channel. And then there is a, a third parameter, eta, which is one if the channels are decoupled. And you see in this particular channel, this is almost equal to one. So in this particular channel, channels are almost decoupled. Uh, so maybe it would be fine to treat them as decoupled, but they didn't. Uh, but um, 
they have further on studies of some channels that that are not um, nearly decoupled. So they studied several systems where actually channels do couple strongly and eta is not equal to one. So that's it. Is there some question here? No, this is becoming complicated. Huh? Um, I'm trying to simplify as much as possible. Um, okay, so now I have a scattering amplitude as a function of energy for real lattice energies which are observed on the lattice. All energies on the lattice are real. But you, in order to find whether there is resonances in the system, you again, you continue this scattering amplitude to, to the complex energies and see whether there is some poles in the complex scattering plane. And that's the location of poles. For Let's consider the S-wave channel. S-wave channel, S-wave L equal to zero was the one that is given here. So I said, we expect kappa resonance and another scalar resonance from this. So let's see, the pole, there is really a pole um, for, for this guy. It's on the real axis. It's below the threshold. You see k pi threshold is here, and this pole is on the real axis below threshold. And further on, uh, it is on sheet two. Pole on sheet two, on real axis below threshold is virtual bound state, as we said. So they seem, they get as a here, they get a virtual bound state kappa. This is because actually it's done at very heavy pi mass, it's 400 MeV. And at this pi mass is, um, kappa is a virtual bound state. In nature, in PDG, this is a resonance. Here it is a virtual bound state, okay? Another uh, scalar state is this guy. You see, it's a resonance, it's a scalar resonance around 1.4 GV. Let's see from previous picture. At around 1.4, this will cross the second time 90 degrees, kind of. So here we expect another resonance and here it is. This is a mass of a resonance and this is giving you the width. It's a broad resonance in experiment. And it decays in experiment to k pi and k eta. Um, this, ex, uh, this calculation explored also some other partial ways which I will not comment on because for simplicity. I think that's it for, for this topic. Is there questions? No. Okay, this was the first, the simplest calculation. That's why I presented it. Okay, let's, um, let's go on. What about if, you, so this scattering, you see, it was k on pi on an eta, none of them had spin. What are the additional challenges if hadrons have spin? Well, for all, Okay, many important hadrons, for example, proton and neutron, they are made of has, have spin. So one has to know how to do, to do the scattering in this case. And there is many important vector hadrons, like rho, d star, b star, j psi, and whatnot, which also have spin. So basically, there is many, many interesting channels that uh, one has to consider for conventional and exotic hadrons, which where you have to do the scattering of hadrons, where uh, hadrons do have spin. Like, for example, nuclear nucleon scattering, um, where, the, um, where deuterium happens. Okay, so let's see what is the, just let me mention the additional challenges. The problem is, the additional challenge is that several combinations of total spin and partial wave L lead to certain conserved quantum number JP, even in the continuum. So let's see, suppose you want to do 
the scattering of nucleon and a vector. Nucleon has one plus, vector has one minus, and you're interested in this channel, one half minus, pause. Okay, let's see. The total spin of those two can be either one half and, and three halves. If you want to get one half minus, you can do it either with, if you want to get this correct part, it can be L equal to zero or two. So now let's see. If you want to get this combination of conserved quantum number, you can either do it with spin one half and L equal to zero. This will give one half minus, or you do it with three spin, total spin of both three half and L equal to two. Okay, so, so basically, um, there is these two quantum numbers that give the same conserved quantum number and S and L are separately not conserved, only J and P are conserved, in, even in the continuum. So what's the problem with this? This will lead to several nearly degenerate eigenstates which complicate the problem. So suppose you want to study the pentaquark. The pentaquark ob was observed into the um, nucleon, J psi decay. This is the only observed channel of pentaquark. So since it's a resonance, you want to study then a nucleon J psi scattering. And we did the first study with Ursha Skerbish, who is also online. Um, so this is a nucleon has, as I said, one half plus and vector J psi is a vector which was, has one minus. And as I explained to you, there is, uh, and suppose you want to consider this channel, some of this quantum number, one half minus, then you'll get these two combinations which have the same quantum number, okay? And for this reason, because there is two combinations which give this same quantum number, you'll get, for example, here two nearly degenerate eigenstates. So here you have a nucleon with mo uh, momentum one and chips are with momentum minus one. And there is two eigenstates with nearly the same energy just because you can couple total spin and partial wave to this quantum number, okay? And here, for example, you even have three eigenstates. I'm not discussing actually why, but you can one can understand. The problem is that when you study eigenstates uh, of two hadrons with spin, you get nearly the general eigenstates due to this, even in the continuum, expect them. Because spins can have various projections, but you have to extract, for example, when we consider this irreducible representation, we had to extract six eigenstates to, to, to get all eigenstates in the relevant region. And that's a challenge, additional challenge to all the ones I previously mentioned. Okay, let's see, uh, to, um, I should, Sorry. Uh, yeah. Can we go on this one, yes. Um, so can, uh, you, you uh, considered here only um, um, even Aus or, uh, I mean, just zero? Uh -huh, yeah, this, we, to we considered total moment, ah, no, because if you want to get a negative parity, you only can have even uh, L. Yeah, yeah, and and what about maybe for the for the first case where where S is one half? Uh, what about maybe L equals two? Uh, we still probably can. No, because then you cannot get uh, if you have one half and two, you can never get to one half. Total spin, total angular momentum. Uh, okay. In uh, one. Half and is two, you cannot get to one half. Okay. okay, so I'm supposed to finalize around 350.
330, let me see. Okay, I'll not go through the details of the next study then, but you've seen the major challenge. You have a scattering with spin, then you'll get this nearly generate eigenstates. I'll just give you one minute tour of the next day, and then I want to give you some conclusion that's more important. Okay, so for example, here was a study of a rho pi scattering, where rho has a spin by hadron spectrum collaboration. Okay, and for this same reason, they observe several degenerate eigenstates. And basically, if I don't want to go to details, uh, I'm just telling you now the scattering matrix, if you have, how should I say? Now the scattering amplitude, if you have S, L, if you have these two possibilities, is a, again a matrix. Because these can, via physical processes, turn out into this. Okay. So, so you have to again determine the scattering matrix. This uh, loop function is given by, uh, for, uh, for, for scattering of two particles with arbitrary uh, spin in this reference. So you again have the quantization condition, that is not a problem. And in principle, via the similar techniques I've given you, one should be able to extract, extract the scattering amplitudes. Um, let me see. Okay, but let me at least just so not to leave you like completely in the dark here. Maybe again, let me at least explain what is this. Yeah. So if you have a raw meson pine scattering, the way to get, for example, to this channel one plus, there is two ways. Either you have total, sp uh, total spin of these two is always one, but uh, you have two possibilities, L equal to zero or L equal to two. And since physical process can come from this guy to this guy, this, uh, this uh, sc couple channel scattering matrix will be non-diagonal, okay? So you need to extract this. And, and um, kind of the result in a certain parameterization is given here. I'm just telling you basically this so that you are aware of additional physics that enters when you consider scattering with spin. I actually su suggest you to um, consult these references. Now, I, I want to have a remaining few minutes to kind of conclude this tour that we had, okay? This is, I think, more important than to give you some further details. There is many, many more details. Okay. Ah, this is also just a reminder. We only considered scattering of two hadrons. Now, many people are trying to do scattering of three hadrons. There's been, uh, because some hadron, some resonances decay to three hadrons, but this is very challenging. There's been a lot of analytic work on generalization of Lusher equation by this gentleman. The only channel that has been actually considered in QCD is this channel, which is not a resonant channel. And obviously I cannot cover this topic, but this is quite fashionable these days and many channel challenges are left. Um, I only mentioned the Lusher approach. There is an alternative approach, which is called the Hall QCD approach. And you should look at the references of Aoki et al. To, to, if you want to study the scattering with this approach, I didn't cover it. This is done by the Japanese mostly. Okay, I want to summarize the lectures. Okay just to give you a big picture back because we went through many details. Okay, so if you have a threshold here for a strong decay, all hadrons that are well below threshold, you can simulate, no problem, you extract energy, you get the mass, that's no problem. But for states that are near threshold or above threshold, you have to deal with this business that I described. And I described how to do with bound states and hadron resonances. 
And again, most of res hadrons are resonances, like all the ones that I circled here are resonances. Those are bound states and just below threshold. These are really bound states where you don't have to care about, care about scattering at all. And okay, just a reminder, all basically discovered exotic hadrons are resonances like pentaquark C. It's a resonance two peaks discovered in JPSI proton. So you need to do, do it with these techniques and basically we did one calculation with Ursula Skerbish and that's the only one on the market. Much more has to be done. I mean, I'm just saying that there is much more to be done, especially to, to give any answers to on these exotic states, like fully charming tetraquark that was discovered this year by LATB. It's a resonance. It decays to JPSI and you see these beautiful peaks. Nobody did it. But it's difficult, that's, that's why nobody did it. This FC, which was discovered in 2013, it's a resonance. So you really need to, to you know, this formalism to do these things is important to study. Okay, um, just a brief reminder. Uh, maybe I'll not go, but I, it would be good you look again through what we went over four lectures. First lecture was analytic lecture. Second lecture we went on the lattice. Third lecture was application on the lattice. Fourth lecture is today. So good, you, you refresh a little bit what we did. It, it was a long way, at least for me. <laughs> um, but uh, let me wrap up. And let me wrap up with what I consider as unsolved challenges. What are the solved challenges? What is left for you to do in many things? Okay, so what is the status with respect to lattice studies of various problems on, on this front? On Hadron spectroscopy, where you want to study masses and width and properties of some interesting Hadrons, which are not stable with respect to strong interactions. The mainly solved problems are the masses and bits of resonances that decay only to one channel. But there is not so many of those. It's a raw meson, it's K-star meson, some D mesons, not many. And those are almost uh, mainly solved, but okay, there is still two things. Partly solved on the lattice are problems, masses and bits of resonances that decay to yeah, two or three channels. And those was, was done mainly by the Hadron Spectrum collaboration. Um, and partly so are the resonances that decay to Hadrons with spin. Those are difficult. I explained you the reason today. Some of them are solved. I would say that problems where the resonances decay to more than three channels, these are unsolved. They are very difficult. And most of the exotic Hadrons decay to several channels. Well, the resonances that decay to three hadrons are unsolved. The resonances that decay to either two or three hadrons are unsolved, and there are many examples of those. I think we will need some simplifications, and it would be good to think about simplifications, whether some channels can be neglected, and so on and so forth. Okay, let me emphasize that both interesting exotic hadrons that experiment, in particular LHCB Bell, best, I think, discovered the key to more than two channels. And most of them have not been rigorously studied on the lattice. Some of them I, I, par, par, I contributed to some studies, but um, I would not say if these mysteries are solved. So many exciting challenges are left for the future and particularly experimental colleagues and phenomenologists are really awaiting conclusions from our community. Um, there is progress and you should look into the review papers I've given you at the beginning. I've not tried to give any review papers, uh, reviews here. I just tried to teach you some skills and ideas and the way how to do things. Uh, there is a lot of progress, but a lot of challenges still. So I would conclude with this. 
and for, yeah, challenges for you to solve as an open challenges, right? Um, yeah, so I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Sasha. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Yes. No? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, can you just give me that I would be kind of, how many of you are really dealing with this scattering? Can you give me a cross or a hand? How many of you are dealing for PhD with this scattering? So just I get the feeling. I was assuming you're not dealing with scattering for your PhD, but if you are, please let me know over the uh, uh, chat or or uh, some sign in the no nobody was dealing with the scattering so yeah that was my assumption ah Usha is let me see further on uh, yeah that was my assumption so yeah maybe I should have checked at the beginning uh, verified the beginning but yeah that was my assumption anyway so um, yeah, of course, as this course progressed, things became more difficult, but I think you get a general idea of uh, what needs to be learned and what needs to be done. Ah, there is somebody, pi pi and k pi scattering. Yeah, for you, some of the material was too easy, I'm sure. Um, no questions, more questions? Um, yeah, okay, so maybe just to really conclude, uh, you've seen this Lucher method is really not to study the, the, the most interesting problems which are of real interest for current experiments. One might need to think of some simplifications and I would still I don't know, <laughs> um, maybe not this opinion is shared by everybody, but um, I'm part of se several experimental groups and they really want some results, but it's difficult to give them results. So for, I would uh, really maybe like that people think if somehow some problems can be simplified and make progress around um, on this front as well, but for now, these problems don't seem so easy, <laughs> these most relevant ones. Okay. Uh, maybe a quick uh, comment on your side. Um, so looking at the partly solved and unsolved problems, uh, these all require some sort of major simplification. They're not things that, uh, I mean, which ones can maybe be just solved by a lot of computing time and which are unsolvable at, in, I mean with the current computing I mean with the current ah, method, sorry. but to be honest I never went into the three particle problem so I, I don't really cannot comment so much on that I, I know this is a difficult one but even if you have a resonances that decay to more than three channels and if those hadrons have spin right then you will get like, I don't know, you'll need to extract 50 eigenstates in one irrep with very big accuracy. I don't know what, and then you need to parameterize the scattering amplitudes. Um, okay, given very much computer time and especially a lot of patience, it's maybe possible, but we, when you have more than three channels. Okay, what I mean by simplification? Can one tell me you can really neglect this channel? You don't have to even implement it. You don't have to extract the eigen energies. It's uncoupled, don't care. Or you you can or maybe you can ignore a certain three hadron channels. I've studied several resonances and ignored three hadron channels. Is that can that be done or not? I, I don't know, right? Simplifications in this front. I don't know. Or maybe just an idea. Okay, 
So the problem in lattice simulations is that you want to study high lying resonance. For example, this one. This is high above threshold, right? And you need to extract all eigen energies from threshold up to here. You have to extract first the lowest all. Experiment doesn't have to work in this way. Experiment can concentrate in this energy region, doesn't have to really care about ener you know, lower energies. Here we always have to extract all eigen energies even below. Could there be some method where you only concentrate on a certain energy region and don't care on lower energies? I don't know, probably not with current methods, but maybe one can think about this. I have no idea. But maybe one can think. Okay, thank you. And also thank you for the lectures in general. I have another question or maybe a comment. Uh, if we find a, a frame in which only uh, one way would contribute for each irrep, then mm -hmm. it would simplify the extraction of the phase shift, right? Sure. For example, for k pi scattering, there are certain irreps where only L equal to one contributes, even in moving frames. And actually, we, me and Luca Leskovitz made a paper on this. There are certain irreps, but for those irreps, you don't get, you get certain information, not much. Okay, if you want to do, for example, A1 irrep in moving frame, certainly there will be L equal to zero, L, L1 contributing. So, Sometimes there is certain irreps where only one partial wave contributes. But you see, okay, maybe I was talking only about light hadrons. When you have a charmonium spectrum, then it's, okay, I don't have a picture, but charmonium and charmonium spectrum is pretty dense. Then there it's not so easy even to um, neglect partial wave equal to two or three. There is charmonium with spin three easily. I mean, um, charmonia with spin three, there is many charmonia with spin three in the relevant energy region or spin two. So there you cannot even say that spin two or spin three, uh, L equal to two or three are negligible. So for light hadrons, maybe you worry about zero and one. For charmonia, which I worry about now, even two and three are contributing it. So did you my, in, have in mind particular no, no, I just want to ask, maybe this can yeah, be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is some, certainly rep for certain cases, and that's how we extracted it for the first time case star with back in 2012. But if you look at our phase shift, it didn't have a lot of data. <laughs> ah, I see. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hello. Uh, Nelson here. Uh -huh. I'm... Hi. Hello, thanks for the, for the lectures. Thanks. Um, I'm the one who is working with the Pi Pi K Pi scattering here. Okay. Um, and my project actually is doing at, at least Pi Pi and K Pi scattering uh, at physical biomass. Okay. Would you expect that to affect too much anything else than computational cost? Like, would you, would you think that would complicate anything? And would you say that that would be an advantage in comparison? I mean, um, of course, it would be great to have K-Pi um, scattering at uh, physical, K-Pi scattering at physical pi. Pi-Pi, I think it was almost done mm -hmm. uh, at physical pi mass. Um, is there... I'm more, is, usually when you have the physical pine mass, there is more channels open. So this is a worry if there is, I, I, let me see, there are more channels open, but maybe not. So you're aiming at K-star resonance or what, K-kappa? No, K-star, just K-star. K-star. I think for K-star, there is no any other. No, no, there is no okay. other, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it has not been done in much detail at the physical pi mass. I think K pi, there is still some way to do a progress in K pi scattering. It's difficult. So, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so, I think it's valuable. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
But note, there is many more resonances than Rho and K star, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, and these are much more unexplored, I would say. Mm, like D meson resonances, uh, B meson yeah. resonances, Charmonium resonances. And these are of very much interest of current experiment. Experimentalists are discovering them every two months. 